Hey, my legion. How y'all doing today? I'm here today with my buddy John to review <laughs> Star Wars The Last Jedi. And um, this is kind of like with the weather and stuff like this, being filmed on January 9th, I'm probably going to upload this tomorrow because it's a big a blockbuster film. And then I'll do the other movie review a little down the road this week. Well, we reviewed Get Out, but I might have tell you what I thought of it. And, uh, you know, it was really cool. We got to get out. Well, no, we got to go to Tinseltown and stuff like that. And John was nice enough to get me a ticket for my birthday to go see it. And we both watched it. And uh, it was really weird because this is more like a sequel to Force Awakens. And when I saw Force Awakens, I thought it was all right. I wasn't too thrilled with it. Yeah, it was okay, but too familiar. Of course, that's the funny. Is some people are bitching, oh, Force Awakens was... Too much of a retread of the other movies, and then her bitching that this was too different. Yeah. But it really wasn't that different. I mean, like, the uh, way Luke Skywalker is, is kind of like how, what Yoda and uh, Obi Wan did after things turned to crap, too. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of reminiscent of that, but they still did an excellent job. I was really captivated from this movie from right from the start. Uh, great sense of humor awesome action and stuff like that and you really cared about the character you get to see Carrie Fisher again and you get to see uh, of course Mark Hamill Luke Skywalker he plays a big role I mean you saw him just a little bit towards the end of Force Awakens you know what I mean but I mean he's really in this a lot um, really strong characters like I said I mean and they don't and they have like those uh, little bird bird like creatures what do they call puffins or something there are porgs, and Pork, they're, porgs. but they're actually puffins because the island, in, I believe Ireland, that they shot it on has puffins all over the place. Oh, okay. So they're like, well, what the hell are we going to do? They're just in every shot just about. So they just animated them and turned them into these creatures called porgs, and then went a little bit further with them, so it was really good. Yeah, I mean, because they were saying like that could be another... Thing like Jar Jar Banks, not at all. They were they were very entertaining right. and funny too. I, I liked them. Um, it was just it was weird. I said puffins because John put something about Saturday morning and had a picture of HR puffin stuff from old Seals and well not Seals and Croft, uh, Marty Croft. What was it Marty Croft production or something? Seals and Croft were did Summer Breeze. <laughs> that not the uh, feminine hygiene project, but the old song see i go off on a tangent uh, stuff like that so now did it throw you off like other people when he had that moment of silence during a one battle scene no i mean i, I kind of figured whenever you know that was like a scene like uh holy crap moment and stuff like that the whole audience yeah. could hear a pin drop but i mean they had a story on this edition whatever when they first played that people paid like Twenty-two dollars seeing IMAX theater, and the music would play, but they didn't have any sound. Right, but this was different. Then. This was yeah, different. this was different in the movie. But people were still bitching, saying, yeah. "Oh, there's something wrong with the audio. It craps out for a little bit." Well, that was because of to enunciate, or if that's a, a word I'm looking for, the scene to enhance the scene. So you know, a lack of music and sound, or specific sounds, could be dramatic. And I think I'm, I can't remember if I mentioned this in a previous yeah. Yeah. Uh, video, but I'll mention it again if I did. In the episode of Buffy Vampire Slayer called The Body, Joss Whedon is very specific with the sounds he uses. And uh, it works. Instead of having a lot of uh, noise in the hospital, you only hear certain sounds. Like a, you hear the corner zipping the body bag. You know, it's all very specific. And that can also enhance the mood as well as music or other sounds. And I think they do that in Star Wars. It's sort of like, uh, I, I still have to get you to watch one of the movies that I uh, sponsored through Kickstarter. Maybe it was Indiegogo, one of those. But uh, I told, it's like at the beginning of the movie, you see this guy who's like, he's kind of cut off from everybody. His parents have passed away. And his character's really isolated. And you see him walking home from playing cards with some old ladies and he's walking along into winter and I told the director I said John here's a thought don't put any music behind it just have the sound of the crunching snow as Matt King's character is walking along 
because I've noticed that when I've been out walking, like in college and stuff, and you know, you're by yourself uh, and you just hear that crunching of the snow, and it's a very isolating feeling. And I said, I think that will work. So he actually changed it and did it that way, although he added some uh, sounds of the wind blowing too. But yeah, lack of sounds or specific sounds can work perfectly. And that's what uh, Rian Johnson did for that movie. And then, just like I said, in that, when I saw, I remember I saw uh, Cyanide Dead and Night Part 3, You Better Watch Out, with Bill Mosley, who played like the Bubblehead character in this one, who played Crop Top in uh, Text Chainsaw Part 2. And then Robert Culp was in that. And I remember seeing that with my friend uh, and former uh, soldier and roommate when I was in the Army in Germany. Jeff Moscone, and there were scenes where the not there wasn't a music, a lot of silence in it. And I thought it was really scary. But Fangoria, well, I remember buying Fangoria. They reviewed it and they said that there were scenes like screaming for music. It seemed like an incomplete film. I thought it was perfect that way. Yeah, uh, you just I think people get too used to it, so they're they can't comprehend it. But uh, if it's done right, it works perfectly. You don't always have to have sound. He would, I mean, I was very blown away. I really enjoyed that. And um, my mom saw it a while back, and she said it was really good. She'd never seen a Star Wars. And that's for, and for my mom, who doesn't like who doesn't really like it, but she really enjoyed it. It's very entertaining. And like I said, there's lots of little kids there. It's still PG-13, but still, you know, I mean, mostly... A lot of people die. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I mean, even though it's not like a hardcore PG-13, there's still the scene with the milk and the scene watch. a little raunchy. You know what I mean? A little gross. Just like whenever uh, old Luke Skywalker cut open that monster and uh, oh, yeah. oh, uh, Empire Strikes Back, you saw his guts jump out and he hid inside the monster to keep warm on that planet. Well, people are pointing out, uh, what's the... Uh, it was a third movie, Return of the Jedi. Yeah. The Ewoks. Yeah. And it's like, if you pay attention, you see all these helmets from Stormtroopers. It's like, and remember, they're bringing everybody in, strung up and hanging from, like, uh, poles. It's like, were they eating everybody? Yeah. Did they eat the Stormtroopers? <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. like, holy shit, they might have. Yeah. And it's weird because you say the third one, the, the original... The original three, yeah. yeah the original three, which was eighties, six. Or yeah, it'll be part like six now. It's so weird though, because right. the very first Star Wars, I still call it Star Wars, but now people say Star Wars Episode Four: New Hope. Right. But I still consider it the original Star Wars, and like I consider these like different phases of the Star Wars. They're all Star Wars movies, but this was like uh, the original three, you know, from the seventy eighties, and then like the oddball three. Like I, I still have got to do a review of the holiday special. <laughs> and then uh, the two Ewok movies that were made for TV, and George Lucas in front of me. You know? Well, I still want to know why Disney didn't continue Lucas' storyline, because these three, you know, the two that are out and the third one's coming, yeah. is not what he had envisioned. He, he had an outline, and they just ignored him. Now, I understand, you know, the, the, the previous three he did weren't as good as the first three. Yeah. However, okay, take his outline and hire a good writer, like the guy that wrote Empire Strikes Back, or Frank Darabont that did three excellent adaptations of Stephen King with Shawshank Redemption, Green Mile, and The Mist, which is one of the toughest things to do in writing is adapting a book to a movie. Or even, um, oh, no, I can't remember his name, is it Goldman that wrote the book and movie Princess Bride? And he also did... Uh, the Stephen King movie at Hearts and Atlantis. He's a very good writer too. Get someone like that to write and you know, but to follow his outline. And then you can branch off and do other stuff. <laughs> uh, so I wonder why they just ditched his stuff. It was just because of his last three Star Wars movies weren't as good. Yeah, I mean it was weird because I mean I thought Yeah, I mean, because I was always excited to see Phantom Menace and then it's like eh. and then Tag of Clones it seemed like people were too Serious, it was kind of like, I mean, I still liked it. I mean, I still liked him all for the most part. I mean, right. I thought Revenge of the Sith was actually quite good. I mean, leading up to, you know... Well, the second one of that trilogy, yeah. I kind of liked where um, Obi-Wan's doing investigation stuff. Yeah. That was kind of really interesting. I mean, it was still interesting stuff. It's just like, 
it was just so different. I mean, that's like I said, the prequels, and then this was like the new batch or new breed and stuff like that. But it was cool seeing Carrie Fisher, sadly, in her last role, though. But she was very And her good. daughter is in it as well. She's a blonde with her kind of yeah. hair almost up in buns, not quite like her mother had yeah. in the original. But, yeah, Billy Lord, that's her daughter, who was also co-star in Scream Queens. But, yeah, I, I think they said in Force Awakens, she uh, got a role. They didn't know that that was Carrie Fisher's daughter, and she didn't tell her mom that she was in it. Oh, that is cool. But it was kind of cool for this one that they gave her a much bigger role. And so, you know, mother and daughter had a lot more screen time. Now, if they could have only got Carrie's mom in it, too, that would have been... been Awesome. That'd be neat to have like all three generations there. Yeah, I mean, I really liked it, and I think Debbie like, Reynolds for those who didn't know. Yeah, that. <laughs> Debbie Reynolds, and she was in that cool movie. Uh, I think she was nominated for Oscar. She was in that cool uh, Albert Brooks movie, Mother, which is a really funny. I only seen it once, but I really like. I can't it. remember if I seen that one or not. But she was in one. I uh, what's that? My Mister, or where where uh, Albert Brooks had like a daughter. or or friend with this goth girl or something like that. That was really good too. And speaking of going off on my first tangents, mi- my first Mister. That's what. Okay. I'm I'm good, sorry. Speaking about going off on tangents, Albert Brooks kind of got to start with Saturday Night Live too because I was watching them uh, several years ago, the early seasons on uh, Netflix, and he used to do short films yeah. in Saturday Night Live. And before they would name the cast when they're just uh, they're not they're ready for primetime players. Yeah, and some of those were really good. Like, uh, he had that one... Uh, and Mark Mull was a member of the cast, yeah. but people forget. Well, he was on camera, and then someone said, hey, what's going on here? And he shoved him out of the way, I think. Or that one film, I did like a review of Carrie Fisher hosting the original, uh, I mean, uh, Saturday Night Live when Star Wars came out, you know. And there was like an Albert Brooks film, I think, like this one girl and this one couple, old couple went to Rome, and then... Uh, the old lady started going out with this younger guy and left the other guy behind. Now, today was the second time I seen the Star Wars movie, and both times I missed Carrie's dog. Because I don't know if you've ever seen the interviews where she has her dog with her. Huh. Yeah, and that's actually her daughter's dog, but she ended up uh, taking over her daughter's dog. Oh, that's And, uh, yeah, I guess, I think it might have been a casino scene or something he appears. And both times I missed that was really, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's very live like, action and stuff like that. They said it was like the longest Star Wars, like two hours, two and a half hours or something yeah. like that. But I really liked it. I thought it was a vast improvement over Force Awakens, which was kind of a disappointment. And no real dull moments. Like, I love Rogue One, but the first, like, half hour was really slow. All right. But, I mean, this one was pretty much all the way through. I mean, it's, it just slowed down some in the middle, but it's still very good. It's weird seeing, like, major actress, uh, like, Laura Dern, who still looks good, by the way, and then uh, and then Benicio Del Toro, you know, have roles in this, too. Like, Well, I wonder if he was a geek, too, because Lauren, Laura Dern on uh, Jimmy Kimmel, she's talking about uh, she's a huge Star Wars geek. So I think she was geeking out the whole time yeah. she got to be in the movie, and then on Kimmel with Mark Hamill, because they had, like, um, uh, most of the cast on... Uh, you can watch it on YouTube, I think it was... Oh, I maybe like 16, 20 minutes or something oh, like I'd that. Oh, i definitely check that out. And it's weird. I can't remember if, like, uh, they re-released uh, after the success of Star Wars. They re-released Corvette Summer, or Corvette Summer was after Star Wars. I can't remember, because Mark Starmer, Mark Starmer, Mark Hamill starred in that, too. Was he in Corvette Summer? Yeah, or that... him and Andy Potts. Okay. Which, I didn't recognize. Which was the one with Harrison Ford? Well... Wow, which uh, well, there's a Lucas movie where he's driving around in a yellow car. Oh God! Because um, they made they just kind of reference that in the uh, the Jimmy Kimmel or uh, the video or him and Matt Damon were going at each other and stuff. Uh, I can't remember. Oh man, American maybe it's American Graffiti. Oh, American Graffiti. Yeah, that's a, like. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, okay. It was so weird because he was a star. He directed American Graffiti, a big hit, which influenced Happy Days. And then he was going to all these studios, and no one was interested in his idea for Star Wars. Because he did, like, a science fiction movie, THX 1138, which I really liked, which was a yeah. flop. That was based off his student film, THX 11384 EB, I think it was called. Which I never saw that, but I bet you, I bet you that's probably on YouTube. I should look it up. 
But, I mean, he made this, and it was like a western in space, and no one wanted to touch it. And then he finally went to 20th Century Fox, and he said, well, I'll play you in a poker game. If you win, I won't mention it again, but if I win, you have to film it or something like that. It was, well, I think part of the deal is I think he waived his director's fee. Yeah, okay. But he talked them into letting him have the merchandising rights. Yeah. And that was before merchandising really became a thing. And merchandising? He, yeah. <laughs> Spaceballs? Yes. <laughs> but search for more money. <laughs> but the weird thing for that was on uh, the toys that made us, they were talking, he made, you know, because he was trying to make a thing to rush the toys out uh, before the movie came out. So people want to try to copy and stuff like that. But and they end up doing a deal with Kenner. But Kenner was a small company, but they he made like a, a deal with them was probably the worst deal in Hollywood. Where Kenner, for every dollar that they made, Kenner would keep ninety five percent, and then like the studio would keep like two and a half cents, and he would keep George Lucas would get two and a half cents. Yeah, but dollar. yet uh, off the first three, <clears throat> his studio and whatever else he did back then became worth four billion dollars oh i know I, i'm just saying they said <laughs> so it, it might have been a bad deal but yeah. he still made a shit oh, ton I know of money i know he did and then it was like some like they said like uh ken would have to pay him at least if not that at least ten thousand dollars a year and then somehow they didn't pay him when it started to slow down and then it lapsed and then he started to do another thing where he'd give like the rights to other companies and stuff so he raised me i mean i they all still made a lot of money, but it oh, was yeah. just really different back in the time. But I really liked it. I bet you a lot of people in the audience wish, with the snow being as bad, they had some of that red salt from that planet put all over the driveways and on the roofs and stuff like that. <laughs> really cool. But, I mean, I liked it. It's very creative. All the monsters were neat and stuff like that. I thought, I know, I just didn't like The Force Awakens, but this one I, I really enjoyed right. very much. I, I give it a full on 10 out of 10. Lots of action. Lots of really, like, Tension with the, like the remote control that dropped those things at the very beginning, well close to the beginning, you know, it's very entertaining. I really enjoyed it. So I mean, is there anything else I wanted to say? And I'm then done. I think Solo's coming up next about the. They were gonna go like uh, do a thing about the place where they make those little cups for the special. That's gonna be the next uh, Solo. <laughs> solo cups. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That might be about Han. So I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's I really, Han Solo solo movie. Yeah, there you go. And uh, they fired the director. And I think Ron Howard's taken over, but there's still rumors that it might not be a good that good of a movie. So it sounds like even Ron Howard might not be able to save it, even though he's a brilliant director. Oh wow! But I mean, it could be a remake of the Marion Man T- People's movie Solo too. See, we go <laughs> off on tangents all the time. But I really enjoyed Star Star Wars: The Last Jedi. I want to thank my friend John Walkwitz for being kind enough to, uh, you know. Uh, treat me for my as my birthday present out to uh, see Star Wars The Last Jedi so until next time my buddy for me and my buddy John at John's place take care of my leech right. bye 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 stop you bastard <laughs> now it doesn't want to shut off oh it doesn't want to shut off